Okay, so we're going to start tonight uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 all the way down through verses 29. I have done some of these verses together, but I didn't... I've done some of these verses before, but I haven't done them all together in one particular setting. So tonight I'm going to go through at least those four verses, and then I hope to get to Luke chapter 23. So before we begin with the holy reading of the word, I'll ask Brother Danny Richardson, would you say a prayer for our service, sir? Lord, thank you for giving us a chance to come together this afternoon. I open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us tonight through your word. God, thank you for all the blessings you give us every day. And be with us in God's we say tonight. Take us home safely after church and pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, please, if we could. We're going to be Ephesians chapter 4. I really wanted to start in verse 26. If, if you look at the front of your prayer list, I think that's the verse I put on there. Nope. Okay. I had two different sermons for today. I didn't choose that one, and we're going with this one. Ephesians chapter 4, I wanted to start in verse 26, but you really can't do just verse 26. You have to do verse 25 so you can understand what verse 26 is talking about. So Ephesians chapter 4, when is anger okay was the title for the message. This really could be a three-part sermon. It really could. I'm going to try and get through as much as I can tonight. But in, in the grander context, I tried to condense it as much as I could because it, I... <sighs> Brandon and I got together earlier today a little bit, and we were talking about some of the analytics from the video services themselves. And I want you guys to understand that I know that sometimes in order to get the point across, you have to be just as fast as you can because you only have a person's attention for about that long. So sometimes you have to just get straight to the point. But then I also understand that sometimes if you go straight to the point and you lay no foundation for that point, then some people hear your point and pay no attention to you. So I'm struggling in myself to see to it that I get the point across, but I lay the foundation. So we're, we're going to Ephesians chapter 4 because the foundation of all that we do here in the church is the Word of God. And, and we're going to address a very real topic. I'm not just picking this because two people came to me this week and, and they said, you know, Brother Claude, I'm, having, I'm struggling with anger issues. That's not why. I, and I have to, like, I have to guard my words pretty closely there because I, I want to stand in the pulpit of God and I want to be completely honest with you. But several people this week, several means more than a couple, so that's at least three. So anytime I say several, it's at least three. Had come to me this week very specifically with anger management issues. They had anger issues in their lives. And the great thing about that is it's completely addressed in Scripture. It is. It's completely addressed in Scripture, but yet we come to church, we don't hear the sermon, or we don't pay attention to the sermon, or worse, we hear the sermon, but we don't apply it to our own lives. And because we don't apply it to our own lives, then we deal with those anger management issues forever. Anybody? Nobody want to say amen to that? Okay. So in, in this particular instance, I also want you to know there was so much in Scripture about anger that I really condensed this quite a bit. So I would love to have your attention on anger for at least a three-part message. But tonight we're going to do as best we can with the limited amount of time we have. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. I was taught in school you're supposed to say the verse three times before you start reading it. I know we're all there already, but Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Sorry, it's just stuck in me. <laughs> Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So if you look at this, the title message is, when is it okay to be angry? And the first verse that we go to is a verse that talks about what makes us angry. We get mad when somebody lies to us. Amen? Amen. But right here it says that we are in control not of what that person does or that person says. We are in control of what it is we say. He says, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. So he's not asking us to get angry about somebody lying to us. He's asking us not to lie to anybody. So then in turn, they're not mad at us. Think about it. If everybody in the world that claimed to be a Christian refused to tell a lie, then the other half of the world wouldn't have any reason to be mad at us because at least we're honest. I, I, I wish is a, a great sentiment, yes. But really and truly, if we're talking about anger management, it's really important for us to see here that, that they're addressing, that God himself is addressing anger in the Christian body to the Christian body. You want to be in control of someone being angry at you? Don't lie to them. 
Don't lie to them. They don't have an excuse to be angry at you. They may still be angry at you. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. I don't think that was supposed to be a question mark. I think I mis mistyped that. Okay. Be angry and do not sin. So when is it okay for us to be angry? Well, it says you can be angry. But then it says do not sin. So here's the answer to the question, when is it okay to be angry? And I hate that I'm doing this so soon in the message because this is when everybody's going to hear the answer. They're going to click off the rest of this and not hear the rest of the message. When is it okay to be angry? When you're still in control. <laughs> be angry, but do not sin. So if you want to be mad, be mad, but don't sin. And if you're mad and you do something and it's sinful, you're the problem. Because remember, God is addressing the church, <laughs> and the church, he is told, don't lie and be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath. I love and hate this. I do. I, 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 there's a given, sorry, I'm human. I'm mortal. Sometimes my wife says stuff to me, and it's late in the day, and I think I should have more time. <laughs> I want to hold on to my anger. After all, it's mine. And God said I can have it as long as I'm in control. But then he says, do not let the sun go down in your wrath. And I'm like, but I've only had it for a little while. Kim's laughing because she knows. <laughs> Think about it. God is telling us if you don't want anger, if you don't want rage, if you want to make the world a better place, what are you supposed to do? You're not supposed to lie to anybody. You're supposed to be mad as long as you're in control. And then the last part, this is my interpretation. This is not the King James Version. This is my loose interpretation of what the King James Version is telling us. Get over it. <laughs> get over it. And this is the hard part. You're saying, well, what do you mean get over it, Claude? You have no idea what that person said or what that person did. Aha! You're worried about what somebody else is saying? And somebody else is doing? Where do you find that in Scripture? You're worrying about what somebody else is saying about you, and it's not true? I wonder how Jesus would respond to that. We're going to get to that later. Since, after all, he is our example, and since, after all, he lived the perfect life, and since, after all, every time I talk about anger, they go, like, what about Jesus? He cleansed the temple. And I say, okay, there is righteous anger. There is, like, great, explain that to me. I will. You want to know the difference between righteous anger and every other anger that you've seen demonstrated in your entire life? Jesus was mad in the temple because the people were disrespecting God. That's righteous anger. You get mad because somebody disrespects you. That's just selfish. You are not on par with God. And you say, well, Brother Claude, you don't know what they say and you don't know what they did. I'm like, read through all of Scripture and all that they said and all that they did to Jesus. And the one time we see he got angry had nothing to do with them talking about him, had nothing to do with the fact that they were trying to kill him, had nothing to do with the fact that they were lying about him. It had everything to do about the fact that they were disrespecting God. When can you be angry? As long as you're in control. When do you display righteous anger? When you're defending God and not yourself. Verse 27. Nor give place to the devil. If we violate any of those tenets that we have read from verses 25 and verses 26, we are giving place to the devil. If we tell a lie, we're giving place to the devil. If we get angry and we commit a sin, we're giving place to the devil. If the sun has gone down and you have decided you wanted to hold on to your wrath because after all it's yours, you are giving place to the devil. Be angry, do not sin. 
get over it. Or else you're giving some place to the devil. And this is the thing, ladies and gentlemen. If you've surrendered your life to Christ, there's no room for anybody else. You're full. God does not want to share you, and I'll be honest with you, neither does the devil. He don't want a little bit. He wants all of you. Who am I talking about? Both of them. Because that's what you get. You can't straddle the fence. You get one or the other. Verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. We started this off with when is it okay to be angry? And we see here the focus wasn't on the right place. We see here that, it, that if someone is guilty of doing something, remember, we're supposed to be angry, but sin not. We're supposed to not let the sun go down on our wrath. So then tomorrow when I get up and I see that person who has done something that has offended me in some context, I'm not supposed to treat that person like I'm still mad at them from the night before. I'm supposed to rather encourage that person to work with their hands to do something good. Why? Because the focus of our efforts as Christians, the focus of our efforts as little Christ, the focus of our efforts of being the church, the hands and feet of God, is supposed to be our focus on getting someone who is in need something that they don't have. There's a lot of people in this world that don't have Jesus Christ. How do we help them get that? We encourage someone who's done something wrong to turn around and do something right. Verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. I'm going to read this one again, and then we get point number one. I've got time. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. What are we supposed to be saying? We're supposed to be saying things that are good and necessary. Good and necessary for edification. What is the edification? It is the building up. What are we supposed to be focusing on? We're supposed to be focusing on not what somebody else is saying, but we're not supposed to be lying. We're supposed to be angry, but we're not supposed to sin. We're supposed to get over it. We're supposed to see someone who's done something wrong. We're supposed to encourage them to do something right so we can reach those people who are lost. We're supposed to realize that the words that come out of our mouth are guided by the very word of God. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Put an asterisk next to it. This is the word of God telling us to be in control of what we say. And he's telling us that it's supposed to be good and it's supposed to be edification. Why? That it may impart grace to the hearers. Point number one. No, no explosion. It's okay. It's all right. We'll get through it. What we say should produce grace. As Christians, what we say to our spouse should produce grace. As Christians, what we say to our co-workers should produce grace. As Christians, the things that we say to people that we don't know are supposed to produce grace. The things that you say are supposed to be monitored by the very word of God that you claim to serve. And we're supposed to not only monitor them, but we're supposed to be in control of them, which is why in the beginning when you say, okay, I want to know when I can be angry, as long as you don't lose control. Why? Because as soon as you lose control, woo, your mouth runs 100 miles an hour. I'm not picking on Carson, but he thinks I am. Anybody want to claim that? Anybody want to say amen? amen? A couple of you are honest. Carson, you want to throw one in there? Okay, all right. When we lose control of our mouth, grace doesn't flow out of it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Point number one, <laughs> when is it okay to be angry? As long as you're in control. And as soon as we start mouthing off, we have lost control. 
<clears throat> all right, so from Ephesians chapter 4, I want us all to go to Luke chapter 23. Please, everybody turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Because I'm going to have to skip around a little bit here in Luke chapter 23. I don't have time to give you the whole story, so I'm going to give you the, the, the <coughs> Cliff Notes version. We're going to start in Luke chapter 23. We're going to start in verse 14. Very good. <clears throat> Luke, chapter 23, we'll begin reading in verse 14. Then we're going to skip verse 15 and we're going to go to verse 16. Luke, chapter 23, verse 14. I really should have included verse 13 so you could know who's saying this, but I'm going I'm to let you fill in these blanks because you know this story. Luke, chapter 23, verse 14. Said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, if you haven't picked it up just yet, they're talking about Jesus. They're talking about Jesus standing there on his trial. So he is saying, all right, so I, you have brought this man to me, and you said that he misleads the people. And I have examined him. Not only did I examine him, but I examined him in front of you. Continuing in verse 14, he says... <clears throat> I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accused him of. You know what he's saying here? You guys are liars. I have found no fault of those things of which you accused him of, and you were standing there when I questioned him. So what he's saying is Jesus is on trial, and I have found that this Jesus has done nothing wrong. Skip verse 15. Go down to verse 16. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Chastise, when it's used in Scripture, means whip. It means beat. It would be torture today. We would classify it as torture. Think about this for just a second. Remember, the question was, when is it okay to be angry? The one occurrence that we have of Jesus showing anger isn't about to show up in this particular story, and Jesus has just been found guilty and convicted. I mean, he's been found innocent and convicted at the same time. This guy didn't do anything that you said he did, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to beat him and then let him go. Point number two. Boom. Jesus was sentenced and beaten for being innocent. When is it okay to be angry? I'm thinking in my terms right about now. <laughs> in worldly terms, if you say I'm innocent but I'm going to beat you anyway, I'm thinking that's not real fair. And yet this is what Jesus is going through, and he's going through it. He's recorded in Scripture so that we can learn from it. So if you want to know when it's okay to be angry, just because you're innocent of something and found guilty at the same time doesn't appear to give you the right to be angry. Why? Because that's not how Jesus responded. Let's be honest. Those people who wanted him to be found guilty, they weren't happy about this either. Going all the way down to verse... I think I'm down to 23 now. Let's see. Yes, verse 23. But they were insistent. Who is they? The Sadducees, the Pharisees, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. Crucified for being found innocent, remember? But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified, and the voices of these men and the chief priest prevailed. Jesus was found innocent, but punished. And then they said, that's not good enough. We don't want him punished. We want him crucified. You read through the story. He says, I'm not crucifying this guy. I'm going to let him go. He didn't do anything. And they, they screamed louder. And he says, I'm not doing that. I'm going to let him go. And they screamed louder. Verse 23, but they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. They had decided that Jesus was guilty and he was going to be crucified, and we know the truth. He had done nothing wrong. When is it okay to be angry? In worldly terms, I think we're past that point. In biblical terms, skip all the way down to verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What? 
our example of perfection, our Christ, our Savior, was put on trial for doing something that he didn't do, what does that mean? He was falsely accused. He was falsely accused. They knew he was falsely accused. He said as much, I didn't find any guilt in this man about the stuff that you said he did. So I'm going to beat him. I'm going to let him go. They said, no, no, that's not good enough. Notice they didn't say, oh, no, we're serious. We're not lying to you. They said, it's not good enough. To the point where he agrees, okay, fine, I'll crucify him. Jesus is on his way to the cross. He's on his way to see the Father in heaven. He knows that he's going to die because that's what he came here to do. And even though they lied on him, they had him arrested and tried for something he didn't do. They had him beaten for something that he didn't do. He suffers through all of that. They're taking him to have him crucified. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When is it okay to be angry? When you're still in control. <laughs> when you're still in control. How do I display righteous anger? When it has absolutely nothing to do with me. Say whatever you want. I promise you, it's not going to be the worst thing that was ever said about me. Do whatever you want. I promise you, it's not going to be the worst thing that I've ever been through. But ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, these are our marching orders. Not just for the preacher. Not, not, not just for the super deacon that has everything under control. Not just for the Sunday school teacher. This is what the church of Christ is supposed to look like when the rest of the world looks at us and says, Wow! There's something special there. And we're supposed to say, Yes, sir. There's Jesus here. I think we miss out on that far too often. Because the rest of the world looks at us, and dang it, we look just like them. <laughs> but, tonight, we can change. Point number three, I'm sorry. Sometimes I get excited when I get close to the end of the message. Thank you, Kim. If Jesus can forgive this, how do you justify being mad because you got cut off in traffic? How do you justify being mad because this is, this is a first world problem right here. You got woke up by a phone call too early in the morning because they wanted to check on your car warranty. <laughs> if that's the worst part of your whole day, why do you let it ruin you all day long? And I know it's not just the car warranty. I know they also call to sell you the internet, but this, that's a first world problem, ladies and gentlemen. You have to deal with telemarketers. I bet you there's some people in Afghanistan that would like to have a telemarketer call them, but they're busy hiding for their lives because they declared obedience to Christ and now the Taliban's in control. Really, if Jesus can forgive being lied on, being convicted, and crucified, how do we justify being mad just because somebody said something we didn't like? truth is, we can't. We try to, but we shouldn't. Because we can be mad as long as we're in control. We can display righteous anger in defending God. Jesus didn't lift a finger to defend himself. And he's our example. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I, I hope that you open our hearts and our minds, and I hope that you challenge us to read through your word and to let it consume us so that we no longer look like the world, but instead when people see us, dear God, they know that they're looking at you. Amen.